very thankful to the Bryans for bringing us here. Uh, Brian almost got an A in that class, but I think he got nothing but A's after my class. That's what I heard anyway. Um, but it's, I'm really glad to be here with Jake. It's an honor to be standing up here, honestly, with a former student and talk about a project that just began, as you'll as you soon hear about. I will say, I think our story is really very much, uh, is well suited to the context of the prize, the Saban Prize. And as you're, you're going to hear in the next 35 minutes as we talk and then we engage with you all, we really want to accent that. How do you take an idea and make it a company? In fact, I, I'm a little miffed, to be frank with you, because I wanted to make this prize retroactive so we could get our hands on this 25000 and Brian assured me that that was not possible. But we came down here anyway. Um, so what we want to do is three things, as you can see in the, on the board behind me. Just We're going to start with a very brief overview of this idea, the context for the idea. We'll spend most of our time with point two, how the idea came to fruition. On our way down here, we came up with a, what we hoped would be a top ten list, but we couldn't quite do it, so it's a, it's a dozen points that we think tell our story in terms of how an idea, again, became a company. Uh, and then we'll finish very briefly with a, a sort of wrap up um, on this concept that you see written behind me, how we think this concept uh, and, and our company allows for meaningful change. We'll then transition to Q&A and any questions you may have about the nature of offsets, their pluses and minuses, all those things um, we will we'll go from there and we really look forward to it. Um, and we're going to try to keep our comments here very brief. I'm mindful of the clock. Um, I want to mention this as we start, that as you hear our story, as you think about how this idea came from a college campus, perhaps you all will nurture uh, ideas that come from your university campus here, it's important to think about the context. This idea did not just come at any time. It came at the time of the climate crisis, the deepest crisis, arguably, humanity has ever faced. And so when this idea began in the winter of 2005, it was at a very fruitful time for our campus, Middlebury, in the broader context of what we all now call the climate movement. Very specifically, that January, a month before this idea was, was launched, I had organized a conference at Middlebury that included 120 leaders of the nascent climate movement. Um, it led to the book that Brian summarized, Ignition, What You Can Do to Spark a Movement, uh, to Fight Global Warming and Spark a Movement. Um, and our campus, I must say, led by our extraordinary undergraduates, have really been at the forefront of this climate movement. Um, it's in that context that you should think about Brighter Planet. This isn't just an idea that happened to show up. It's an idea that really wouldn't have showed up had we not been at a place full of ideas, full of concern about climate change and what to do about it, and full of, frankly, the belief that we could do something, but we had to get at it right away. And so that's the context for, for how this began. Um, we began in early February of 2005. That's how this idea got started. And as Brighter Planet has gone along, Many of those other students that I've been privileged enough to know at Middlebury have gone on to do other things, taking great leadership in the climate movement. So here's just one example. Um, some of you may have heard of 350.org. And this is the second organization founded by some of my former students and Bill McKibben intended to help fight climate change using the very entrepreneurial skills that you all have no doubt uh, 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 used as, as you came to Yale and no doubt are mastering here. Um, this organization, building on Step It Up, another uh, organization, again, founded by Middlebury folk, is on the front line of this movement. And right now, Middlebury students, along with soon Bill, are in Poland leading this fight to, following the advice of Jim Hansen, try to turn around our uh, increased clim uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, bring it down within our lifetimes, hopefully, down to 350. So again, that's the context for what we're going to talk about. So back to February 2005, um, it, Middlebury was at this time of, of great fruition, thinking about solutions. And our, 
our founding began. And our founding, as Jake is about to tell you, was nothing more than idea, an idea that was brought into a classroom and went from there. Thanks, John. So we have a, a bit of mixed technology today. As John mentioned, we're uh, on the way down. We've, we've had three years to think about what types of learnings we've, we've you know, we could, are noteworthy here. Uh, a lot of, you know, downside, a lot of upside. We've, we've said, well, let's focus on the top 10 upsides. So we have a list of those we're going to go through. But to start, I'm going to go through the overview. Um, as, as the class started, and this is the more technologically advanced part of it, Flash. <laughs> um, EC265 uh, was the name of the class at Middlebury College. Um, I was a junior, um, and I was immersed in this social learning uh, experience where we were dealing with an offset company called Native Energy, happened to be up the road. Um, you all studying offsets right now have heard of Native Energy, um, and we can speak to them later. Um, effectively, we, we had some very broad learnings that came from the class, and we wanted to come up with a way to engage everyday people on climate change, meaningful climate action. Um, the first learning that came from the class was whether or not you believed that climate change was, hap climate change was happening because of the recent science we've, we've heard from the UN, um, or whether or not you believe that uh, clean energy is an important endeavor uh, in order to reduce our country's uh, reliance on for foreign fuels or increase our national security. Clean energy was generally a good thing, and I, I think across the board, um, even three years ago, people were agreeing that a switch to clean energy was a good thing. So that was our first learning. Uh, our, our second learning from the class was simply, uh, there are 80% of us, 80% of the population in the U.S. was saying uh, they were an environmentalist, uh, and, and very few of us were actually going out to do, to change our lifestyles, to spend an extra dollar to, to pay for that green, green premium. There were, besides recycling, there were very few entry points. Um, into being an environmentalist. So both the clean energy learning and, and the barriers to entry led us to this original idea of simply taking uh, an, every do, an everyday tool, uh, a credit card and a rewards program, um, and attaching carbon offsets to it. Um, again, as we'll talk about later, it was never about the carbon offsets. You know, we never wanted to be a full-fledged carbon offset uh, company. This was another tool for fighting climate change. Um, so before we get into this top 10 list, um, we, we asked ourselves, uh, what got us from a class project uh, to a partnership with Bank of America and Visa and the consecutive launch of the debit card rewards program and the credit card rewards program? Um, to warm up, I have um, deep from my hard drive, it's sort of a corrupt file, but John begged me to pull out this from the old days. I have a video from uh, the end of the class project. And back then, I'll warn you, this was called Orange Card. And I'm not going to explain the ideas behind that marketing. Um, but let's see if this works. You yeah. unmute. With Orange Card, you have an opportunity to eliminate your impact on the Earth's climate. Is it still not working? Here's how it works. As much as we try to reduce our impact on the environment, we cannot completely avoid pollution. Each year, in fact, an average American household emits 17 tons of carbon dioxide. Every time you use your orange card, you're taking responsibility to build your climate footprint. With each purchase you make, we'll take the 1% or so that typically goes towards airline miles and instead invest it in cleaning up our country's energy technology. We do this by buying carbon offsets on your behalf. These environmental investments fund the construction of wind farms, local biodigestion plants, and other emerging clean energy sources. With Orange Card, the power to erase your climate footprint is in your hands. Sign up today and feel what it's like to leave no trace. Of course, you couldn't sign up for another three years, but that was the idea. Um, so you can see where we started as a class project. It led to a website. Um, and we went on to go down to New York City and present this idea at a climate conference called Clean Air, Cool Planet, um, Climate Champions. And, and we received, actually, sort of serendipitous, serendipitously enough, uh, the same award that Bank of America was receiving that day for, uh, on behalf of Middlebury College, as a Climate Champion Award. 
Um, that connection that we formed that day as students actually led to the launch of this card uh, two and a half years later. Um, now, uh, as, as we go through this, this top 10 list that we came, down, uh, came up with on the ride down here um, and sort of brought all of our ideas and, and learnings over the last three years together, um, we, we tried to also create sort of a logical, uh, chronological order to all this. But if you, at any point you, you say, where, where are we in the story, um, please, you know, feel free to jump in. Um, we want to make this as conversational as possible. So uh, again, we're not we're not quite yet serial entrepreneurs. This is our first the first company we've started, but the first point that we were very sure of when we began to get ready for this talk was quite simple. Um, make sure you know how to spell text box. No, no, that wasn't. <laughs> um, I, I, it was make sure you have a good idea. Deceptively simple, but this idea of taking offsets and matching them to credit card purchases actually began with a conversation, uh, in a conversation between my dad and I on the morning of the class where I actually introduced it to four young men, two of which were Jake and Andy, the other co-founder. The moment my dad and I over bacon and eggs said, oh yeah, a credit card that could give you offsets, we knew right away it was a good idea. I was assured in my sort of read uh, using my, I guess, emotional quotient, um, I was assured that it was a good idea after I presented it in a class like this as the tenth of ten possible projects for my 45 students in this class. I said, oh yeah, there's a, there's a final idea here, and I described it. And I said, if anybody's interested, come talk to me in the hall as we finish up class. Four guys came and approached me, and again, two were Jake and Andy. And I'll never forget the moment we were looking each other in the eye, and I said, Basically, the idea would be a credit card offsets. We could think about bringing in native energy. Of course, they took it from there. And there was this moment, as Jake was describing on the ride down here, when it was like there was no hullabaloo around us. There were all sorts of students. And we were all looking at each other and said, this is a great idea. And we never really diverted from that concept that we had a good idea. So I think that was really critical. And it was a big part of getting rolling right away. So that's point one. I actually remember we were whispering at the time because we thought right there we had such a good idea we didn't want the other teams to, <laughs> to hear how cool it was. Um, second point, um, I'm going to pull out my list, is you can't fake authenticity. Um, and from the get-go, uh, we were students coming out of an environmental economics class. Uh, our passion was in climate change. Our pas passion and our the passion of our, our close uh, classmates was in fighting climate change. Um, to the extent that we were trying to go with, with no business background into starting a business uh, in bootstrapping and putting ourselves further into debt, we truly were uh, sort of chasing the, the ideals that we had learned in the class from the learnings and this idea that, that this truly would work. It was a good idea. Uh, the inner drive of, of climate change action was, was the one thing keeping us going. Um, and it, it certainly wasn't funding. You know, as you'll see, for a while, we get to, I think, eight or nine bullet points before funding comes into the picture. Um, this is the real fun part about doing a startup and, and having an authentic me message and really speaking with passion is, in, in my learnings, was one of the number one things that was picked up, certainly by the investor community. Um, but, but also key partners. Um, so I will go on to the next one. The next was to be confident. Um, Jake mentioned that a month after the class ended, we serendipitously were invited to help Middlebury College receive an award from Clean Air Cool Planet, now based down the road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Middlebury had done enough at the time to be considered a climate champion alongside the governor of Maine, uh, the Bank of America, the city of Stanford, and I think one other award recipient. And I'll never forget it, as, as I was called, being a professor who was involved in some of this stuff, about having who should be at the award presentation. A month prior, I immediately said, well, get Jake and Andy. They've got this amazing project. So when I offered them the idea, not only did they say, fantastic, but soon they had put together this amazing booth. They printed up business cards. 
They had a, you know, a panel, stuff that we still have in our office. Now we feel it's deeply historic. Um, it was still known as the orange card. But there was this air of confidence around Jake and Andy, who were at the time, one was a recent graduate and one was still just about to start his senior year in college that I'll never forget. So when they were approached by Bank of America officials, uh, a fellow named Ingo Poole, who was a European, who was also sniffing around to see if there was a market for the very same product that we had, had thought about, um, there was just this sense of, yeah, we can do this. Why, why shouldn't we take ourselves seriously? So again, a, as somebody who constantly was in awe of Jake and Andy and their leadership, I think this was a big part of it, a confidence in what they were doing based on, in fact, our first two billets, bullets, be, knowing that it was a good idea and having the authenticity, that the real drive behind it. Learning number four was, to me, perhaps the, the most important learning, and, and one that we had to quickly uh, adapt to, which was to, to quickly learn how to ask for help. Um, along the way, we've had coaches and professors and teachers and parents um, that are lifetime advisors or advisors for a short period. Um, the, the first thing that we looked to was to find the smartest people we could talk to in order to get critical advice on moving forward. Um, John was you know, on the phone with us every day, um, you know, at home, at the office, on his cell phone, wherever we could find him. Uh, we also quickly engaged personal advisors, um, environmental advisors, and business advisors. Um, because coming out of Middlebury College, we, uh, we were taught how to think, but we were not taught the, the, the tactics of moving forward on a business model. Um, and that, that, to me, uh, building this advisory board uh, was a, a, a great asset to the company, which leads on to the next point. Actually, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and show you that board because have you all explored the website? Most of you, some of you, put up your hand if you have. Just I want to get a sense of, so a, a, a number of you have sort of seen what's going on. So just to give you a feel for it, because um, getting these people together was, was huge. So again, here's our website for those of you who haven't seen it. And again, you can go on and get offsets through our credit card, other products. We can come back and show this as necessary. Um, but what Jake was referring to in terms of learning from others and just getting rolling was <coughs> assembling an advisory board. Um, and there are people like uh, Terry Kellogg, a graduate of the SOM, now who runs 1% for the planet. Russell Long, a great uh, uh, entrepreneurial figure in the NGO world. Mindy Luber, some of you may know, the president of Ceres. Bill McKibben, my colleague at, at uh, Middlebury. Uh, an old friend of mine, one of the founders of Cap One, Billy Parrish, a Yale dropout, the leader of the climate movement, of the youth climate movement. Gus Beth, someone you may have also heard of. Um, and so that was huge. We had those names up and running within months. I'm just going to sneak behind you, Jake. Um, and so not only were we learning from them, but it gets to point five, Jake, if you don't mind putting that back up there. Sort of telling the world who we are. I think a big part of credibility, again, this was still six months before anybody had signed a check for us, was simply that we had a lot of social capital. We had a, a network, and we weren't afraid to show it. I'm still amazed when I go to look at new businesses, small businesses, even not so small businesses, and it's sort of hard to figure out who the people are. Um, I think it's particularly important, as I think we showed, to. Just, again, let the world know who you are, and that instills confidence. Obviously, there's a big warm glow one can get if you have people like those I just showed you on your board. Lesson number six, and you can't quote us on this. We might have to edit this part of the video, but don't be afraid to waste paper. This is not an environmental recommendation, but <laughs> uh, more an idea of maintain authenticity throughout the entire business process, uh, or, or nimbleness, rather. Um, our, our ability to be nimble was, was really uh, one of our key selling points to an, an investor and also to our major partner, Bank of America and Visa. Um, and, and for the reasons, uh, reasons following, 
Uh, first of all, we were in a, in a marketplace where the consumer set was largely undefined. Um, traditional marketing demographics couldn't pinpoint the green consumer. Um, it was costing millions of dollars to, to hire the consultants to, to target these individuals. Um, so having our sort of grassroots know-how, uh, John's experience with uh, the youth climate movement and access to, to these new emerging marketing channels um, made us nimble and we could, we could change as, as a small company with that. And secondly, we were, we were in the marketplace for carbon offsets, uh, a marketplace that was changing every day. Um, and we were not directly involved in procuring our own projects, but we were going out and selecting the best projects to meet our needs. So Native Energy up the road meet our, car our rigorous carbon offset policy. Um, and we would go out and select, with the help of our close advisors, um, the most, most authentic projects within their portfolio of renewable energy projects. Um, so being nimble was, it, seem, it seems like a risky startup kind of buzzword, uh, but it was really one of the most critical selling points we had um, and something we still cherish. It's, it's hard to maintain, but, but important for us. And so the way paper fits in there, of course, is that we just had a lot of ideas being generated. And as we were nimble, we could quickly adapt. This is, as you're about to hear, before anybody had written us a check. This was four months after the class had ended. So by now, we're in the fall of 2005. Uh, Jake was starting his senior year. Andy had graduated, was working for Bobby Kennedy at the time. But they had kept the pulse of this idea alive. And much to their credit, they kept printing out and, and, and creating business plans. This is where the paper waste came in. But the idea was that the sort of nimbleness and the ability to adapt that we hope is still a foundation of our company was seen in new business plans, changing the idea, something to send to our advisory board, show to potential investors. We just kept writing. Actually, I should say Jake and Andy kept writing. And so that's the aspect of it that re relates to the nimbleness. Um, the next point we've alluded to now a couple of times is simply just keep on bootstrapping. We um, had not raised a penny at this point. Um, and I, honestly, I think it might have been, uh, I don't want to discourage you from applying for the Sabin Award by any means, but it's interesting for me to reflect on if somebody had written us a check at this early stage, how that would have changed the trajectory. It's a good idea. I'm sure it would have gone fine. But there was something to be, about being so lean and mean that forced us to concentrate. We, we literally had nothing to do, nothing to work with except our idea. And I think that sort of kept the, Jake, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but sort of kept the hunger alive. Also, there was something that also had to happen. Jake had to finish his senior year at Middlebury. Um, uh, or my so, <laughs> so again, our, not only were we trying to create our own human capital, but we were really leaning on our social capital as we continued through the winter of 05, 06 and turn the corner into the spring of 06. Um, not, not a penny to our name, really. Uh, my dad, one of the people who, who had helped this idea to get going and who was a venture capitalist in his day, I grew up uh, just south of here, um, he would occasionally you know, take us out for dinner or do other small things like that. But, but really, we were just sort of on our own. And I actually think ultimately that helped us because, as I mentioned, it helped us to focus. And and actually building on that point, um, when you're really bootstrapping, uh, the passion shows. Um, you can even smell the passion because you've been sleeping in your office. Um, <laughs> but you know, when, you, when you have the story of um, putting your own startup money into it, and, and you know, certainly we didn't come with our own startup money, but we came up with our startup credit cards, and it was startup debt to us, um, you, you, you have this aura of, of uh, bootstrapping, but also um, being able to really tell your story with passion. Um, and the reason I lead into that is um, it leads up to our next point, which is never, uh, don't be afraid, don't, don't us underestimate the power of an open door. Or rather, uh, also don't underestimate the, the power of passion to help you o open doors. Um, very surprising how many, uh, how many top level connections uh, we could reach out to either on a cold call or, or, or you know, close connection through one of our advisors. Um, but, but also the importance of leaving doors open um, and, and maintaining, your, uh, maintaining your options. At one point we were 
we were in discussions with a group in the Netherlands who was launching a credit card called Green Card Visa. Um, and, and another emerging group from Scotland and, and the UK uh, wanted to, to run a similar model over there. And they also wanted to replicate it in the US. Um, we came together um, in Scotland um, in 2006 and, uh, and kind of came together and, and had this idea of forming a, uh, an alliance across startups in, you know, over the world. And you can imagine how trying to structure a, you know, the capital, uh, capital arrangements and the ownership of a bunch of startups coming together works out. Um, that, that never ended up panning out, but the, the relationships that came from that actually led to one of our connections with J.P. Morgan Chase in the U.S., um, which was, you know, and, and a number of the other uh, banks. We, we looked across the board uh, in our early uh, negotiations with the banks. So by not burning any bridges um, and by keeping those doors open, uh, that helped us move forward and continue to make connections. I think this is a really important point, and I'll, I'll just add something to it as, as before I go to the next point. Um, I, I remember years ago when I, I, Brian alluded to, I was in the Peace Corps and I was told the power of informational interviewing upon returning to the U.S. And I was given this advice, as you're in informational interviewing, it's a good sign when you start to hear the same names. So if you're talking to, to somebody and she raises the name of somebody you should talk to, you say, well, I've already talked to that person. That means you're beginning to form sort of a, a, a knowledge base that's going to help you to get a job. It is, by the way, fantastic advice. This was what was happening to us in the spring of 06. One of our first advisory board members was an old friend of mine, Matt Arnold, who was really one of the movers and shakers of what you are doing now, and, and in fact, a series that brings the SOM and the Forestry School together. Matt, in the late 80s, early 90s, fresh with a Harvard Business School degree, said we got to get businesses and environmentalists starting to, talking to each other. And he's one of the first of a few dozen people doing that. Matt took us, our idea seriously right from the get-go and said, well, I talk to people at J.P. Morgan Chase all the time. I know what's going on at Citibank. So we had some credibility there through his generosity and his social capital. And then we brought in a, a colleague from the UK, a wonderful woman named Tessa Tennant, and she began to refer us to some of the same people. So suddenly, as, as, as Jake was getting close to graduation May of 06, my dad, generous enough to be our, the first official member of Friends and Family, he wrote us a check for $5,000. Upon hearing about this big uh, gathering in Scotland at a castle in Glen Eagles, uh, he said, we got, somebody's got to go there. And we all turned to Jake, because he, we knew he would be the most impressive uh, member of our team. To and he's show. afraid of flying, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it, it meant that when Jake arrived in Scotland, and certainly when he returned, we were suddenly part of a conversation that was literally happening around the world about the prospect of matching credit cards to offsets. All of this, by now, we had an office that was no, no bigger than the little area you see here. Um, and still, that was it. We had no assets. That changed uh, with, with, I think, um, a story that revolves around point nine. Um, and to, to keep you up with the chronology and the essence of, of this point. Um, another old friend of mine, a, a, a college buddy, has been a, really, truly been a serial entrepreneur. He had founded three companies before he was 25, uh, uh, two of them while he was an undergraduate uh, at Harvard. So I called him one day, and I'm walking around, and the kids are screaming at me in the house, and the cat is probably you know, doing something I'm trying to clean up. And I reach Bill as he's driving through Boston, and I said, got this idea. You know, I described it. Good idea, so I could quickly summarize it. And I said, wanted to know if you're interested. He said, yeah. He said, I'll write your check for $25,000. And there we were. And not only did we have some credibility and now finally have some money in our pocket, but folks that Jake and Andy had been grooming and talking to, members of our advisory board, other people in our Middlebury and other networks, now we could go to them and say, hey, somebody else just, somebody just wrote us a check. What about you? And so soon we had in that sort of category of family and friends money coming in enough to say, hey, to, hey, wait a minute, something's happened here. Now, I put this under the heading of, of know how to listen to naysayers, because that colleague of mine, one of my oldest friends, um, soon came up to Middlebury. And again, this is guy's got an extraordinary track record of, of startups in the environmental area. He's, he's a brilliant guy. So he spent the day with us. He said, you know what? Actually, he called me after being there. Uh, he called a couple of days later. He said, so here's the deal. He said, I'll give you $100,000. 
I'll, I'll get one of the top environmentalists in the country to be on the head of your board, um, somebody who's been there from the very get-go, an old friend of Bill's by now. He said, I'll do that under the condition that you all become a nonprofit. He said, I don't think you can succeed as a for-profit. We had had a long discussion about wanting to be a for-profit. We liked what that did to your inner drive and your motivations. And I've worked in enough of the nonprofit world to, to see that uh, things can get pretty complacent in a hurry. So here's a guy offering me $100,000 and this incredible advisory board member for Bill to have come in and played a role in this company as he would have had he written us such a large check. It would have been amazing. And I said no. I think he was stunned because <laughs> I've always said yes to this guy. <laughs> Got me in a lot of trouble in college. Um, so <laughs> but I said, no, actually, we've, we've thought about this. And, and, and we, we, we want to go for profit. And there was this long pause on the phone. And he said, Are you, did you just hear me? You know, $100,000, this big cheese, I'm going to help you out. And I said, you know, thanks, Bill. And, and thanks so much for that first check, but no. And, and that was key, to, to know how to listen to not only advisors who were telling you something different, we put them in that broad category of naysayers, but also at the time, and this is another part of this important point, there were plenty of people who were just telling us, it'll never work. I mean, have you all ever, how many of you have ever faced somebody when you come up to them with a great idea and they say, it'll never work? Probably all of you, I see hands going up. And very quickly I learned that most people in the world are in that it'll never work category. Even people you love and admire and work with, they just, ah, it'll never work. Don't listen to those people. But you have to listen to them a little bit. You have to listen to their objections. But if you're sure enough of your idea, you have to take their objections and turn them into positive energy. Jake had a very fine phrase that I'm going to paraphrase uh, that he came up with as we were driving down here. Don't let negative feedback turn into negative energy. The trick is actually to take negative feedback and to turn it into positive energy for your company. I think that's something we've, we've got to do pretty well. So you can see that idea of dealing with naysayers, who at times may be allies, but then that broader category of people who are trying to discourage you, you've got to figure out how to deal with them. Lesson number 10 was be stubborn. Um, now, stubborn. Uh, Stubborn in opening doors is, um, if you know, we found that if you went back five or ten times to the same door, tried to lead to this new connection, uh, and you finally opened the door, that person was usually very uh, grateful for having come back and re made the reminder and the follow-up. Uh, if the door didn't open, sometimes you had uh, somebody that was angry said, "Why are you being so stubborn?" <laughs> on the on the other hand. Uh, being stubborn during the fundraising round was the most critical lear learning for us um, because there, there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of startups and there are uh, very few in Vermont especially uh, angel investors and to the, to the extent that that's true uh, we were fighting with a lot of competition. Um, when, we, when we were at investor forums um, you know, just being very aggressive about getting contacts and following up with investors. Uh, being stubborn really was sort of um, a full-time job while we were raising money. Um, and going into this, this friends and family round, as, as John alluded to, um, we didn't really realize what we were getting into. Uh, when we started raising money and our, our first round, as John mentioned, his, his father put in the first $5,000 to get us overseas. Um, and then we really started running out of money and started calling our close friends and asking for $1,000 increments. Um, and any, any, any legal counsel will tell you um, to be very wary of, of doing uh, investment at, at that small of a, uh, a minimum. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're persistent enough and, and you know what your goals are in mind uh, and, and, and you have that motivation, um, that sort of stubbornness can pay off. Um, and that was a key learning in the fundraising round. And my vision of this, again, that, now this is the fall of 06, to keep up the chronology, is Jake in this office, day after day, week after week, calling people. By now, we had a goal of raising a half a million dollars. And Jake just kept at it, kept at it. He had a spreadsheet. And that was the, what he's alluding to, sort of going back to these doors five, six, seven times. And eventually, it did pay off. Um, we all know that point 11 is, is true. Uh, my favorite phrase in life comes from Branch Rickey, who, who, who um, brought Jackie Robinson to the Brooklyn Dodgers in the late 1940s. And I think it says on his tombstone, luck 
is the residue of design. Uh, and that's a variation on, a, on, on several phrases that are out there. The harder you work, the luckier you get. But we were truly lucky uh, and to get even as far as we have. Um, we had heard about, as an example, an extraordinary woman who had retired from uh, American Express and uh, Bank of Boston, IBM, and was just amazing, according to one of our advisory board members. And for about eight months, we had said to this advisory board member, a guy named Jason Olite, a Middlebury graduate, would you introduce us to this woman, Patty Prairie? And Jason, intentionally or not, was sort of fending us off. And then one fall day, he called and he said, I think Patty would love to meet you. The three of us, Jake and Andy and I, went down with Jason, introduced ourselves to this extraordinary person, Patty Prairie, and it just, something happened. We sat around her, her living room, her dogs were you know, going after their snacks, a very sort of casual Vermont setting, and we just casually, I guess, were making our pitch. And something was in the air, it just felt right, and as we drove back, almost getting hit by a car, I remember, um, on the back roads of Vermont, we felt like, wow, something just happened there. We were lucky because Patty just, that was the right moment to reach Patty. Things were bubbling up. We'd already raised maybe $150,000, $200,000, maybe more into that. We really now had credibility. And that was right around the time, as Patty agreed to come on as the CEO, that we got a call back from Bank of America who said, we really want to talk with you. We've been following what you've been up to. We had a website by now. And we think we, we'd like, we're interested in doing business. So now, we had on our team somebody who could credibly negotiate the very complex contracts that led to our agreement only a few months later with Bank of America. As much as I admire Jake and Andy, they never could have done it. It took a, a, a three decades of experience with, inside of banks and inside of large uh, firms to know how to do that. And luckily enough, Patty came along just at the right time. So that's a big part of this, as we all recognize. And, and moving on, we tried to keep to this to, to 10 points. Um, and I think at one point, we were up to, up to uh, Baker's dozen, and then we knocked it back to 12. <laughs> a a final, final point, and one that has probably you have heard before, um, in a startup experience, especially one dealing with technology or something with uh, dealing with intellectual property, um, it's all about focus, 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 focus. Um, and, and for us, this was very critical. Um, we were not an environmental consultancy. Uh, we were not a broad offset provider. We were focusing on getting a credit card, uh, lots of customers uh, on behalf of the bank in order to make real meaningful climate change. Uh, and now this actually, this actually was an important message for us to retain. This was sort of this outside of the box thinking um, that got us to this original business model in the first place. But, but when we got into the bank negotiations, uh, large institutions have, have, um, have councils they pull together called risk aversion committees. And I, I think it's probably 20 executives that sit around the room and everybody from legal to, uh, to brand um, to, to product, uh, different departments, and they try to poke holes in a product. And you can imagine an emerging marketplace with a startup that still was raising uh, a, an angel round, um, that there were a lot of holes to poke in this new product idea that, that the bank was working through. Um, it was very important at that point that we did not change from our original model, um, and we, did, we, we didn't stray from our, our focus of bringing a high quality product um, uh, with, with high quality carbon offsets, not, not something that we could find for $2 a ton on some exchange uh, low quality um, projects that we couldn't, couldn't tell where the wind was going up. Um, we wanted to bring this authenticity and we wouldn't stray from the model. Um, and the reason the risk aversion committees are, are important here is um, effectively what, what these groups were trying to do was pull us back towards a more traditional model of an affinity card. Um, and when it comes, when you really think about the, the, the business plan that we put together, uh, it wasn't a traditional affinity card. We did not have uh, a list of, you know, a million constituencies that we brought to the, to the table like, um, like Sierra Club might when they came to, to Bank of America and put up a card. Um, so we, we didn't bring those potential card holders to bear. We brought great relationships, um, great partnerships, and a lot of authenticity. The other type of traditional model was a co-branded card. 
Um, there were uh, a lot of these executives in the risk aversion committees were looking for an environmental organization, maybe Greenpeace, that had, uh, that had this brand recognition. Um, and our brand recognition was in the grassroots, was within the, within the youth, youth movement, and we were building it from an authentic ground level. Um, and, and we really stuck to those original um, core values. Um, and that was important in the negotiations even, and, and we did manage to get past uh, a number of those risk aversion committees there. I still have a lingering headache to this day <laughs> from them. So that all went down in the, in the uh, spring of by now 07. And we thought we would be able to launch in the summer and there, those committees and other lawyers and others slowed us down. But uh, on November 29th, 2007, so a year and a couple of weeks uh, ago, Jake, we think, was the first person to actually use a Brighter Planet credit card. He bought a burrito, uh, I think it was, very historic burrito that must still be in his car because we drove it down here. No, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, so that, that's the story. That's how an idea in a classroom two and a half years later was a product. Uh, in the subsequent year, as we can talk about in the Q&A, as you all see fit, we have uh, launched not just a credit card, but a, a, actually a quite successful debit card you can now buy offsets directly from us. If your trips to all these wonderful places are not through us, that would be very scandalous. Um, and we're about to announce some new products. We're about to also announce, probably soon, a new approach to offsets, because we want to make sure we're on the cutting edge of what is still a very uh, challenging and, and a Wild West kind of market. Um, but just to conclude, before we, we welcome you all with question and answers, just very briefly on our third point, um, we really do hope that this concept allows for meaningful change. If you go to our website, you can see the wind turbines, the methane capture facilities that our members are building. We've offset uh, 60 million uh, uh, pounds of CO2, and that's growing exponentially. Um, and even more broadly, we really consider ourselves not just an offset company. Um, so this is the effect we've had. Um, you can see up there a little fancy graphic. Uh, we see ourselves, as Jake alluded to, as part of this broad movement, this rapid, rapid acceleration to clean energy that we need leadership uh, in, in terms of nonprofits and for-profits and certainly colleges and universities. Um, so I think we'll leave it at that. We'd love your questions. Brian, how much time do we have to go to? Uh, half hour. Half hour, that's perfect. So we'd welcome your questions. And again, we're, we're very thankful for this opportunity to, to share our story. And we're going to do something technical and tricky here with a microphone, I think. Oh, we do? OK. I have. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Oh. All right. um, I have a kind of a silly question about this graphic, because I see graphics like this used quite a bit. And I think they're very effective. Um, but could you explain how you're taking um, calculating the weight of CO2 here, is that at one atmosphere in a vacuum, or like, you know, how does somebody interpret that weight? Well, um, when, when, we're, when we're talking about uh, the transition from uh, a weight to volume, uh, yes, you're, you're talking about a very generic sort of atmosphere. So, um, y you know, the volume of CO2, uh, a pound of CO2 would be very different in a vacuum than it would be. In, in a different type of pressure atmosphere. So uh, the, this generic calculation is always done at, at sort of our normal living conditions. Um, it's, it, it is interesting to think um, of, of a gas in the form of a weight. And, and I think that's been one of the major challenges uh, that consumers are trying to you know, jump. Um, because it doesn't come naturally. It doesn't seem tangible. Um, uh, but if you're if you're interested, we can share share that math with you. Any follow up? So it, it, I, I'm just trying to think if you're trying to fill this building. If I'm if I'm trying to explain to somebody what's going on here, um, uh, and you just have the CO2 molecule acting by itself, um, what's what's creating the volume of that 
gas. I mean, is there no other gas that would be in that building that's filling the building? It would just be a vacuum and you're pumping CO2 into that vacuum. I see. Yeah, when you, when, when they're, throughout the process of combusting uh, a fuel, say gasoline, and in, in coming out of the exhaust of a car, um, I think a gallon of gasoline weighs something like nine pounds, but when you combust that gallon, you end up with uh, uh, about almost 21 pounds of CO2. Um, and, and the strange thing happening is, um, throughout the process of heat, um, it, the combustion process, you're giving off uh, moisture in the form of heat, and then you're also uh, giving off carbon, which is connecting with you know, two, two uh, molecules of, of oxygen. Um, and so that, that transformation happens. Um, so when you're talking about CO2, you're, you're talking about a much larger bit than this, you know, six, six, uh, 60 million pounds sounds. It, it, it grows quite substantially. We, we actually tried to, to do this and fill up the Empire State Building with CO2 because we weren't quite sure, but they wouldn't allow us for some reason. So. Hi, okay, so what I love about your idea is that it's it's elegant and it's simplicity, the concept of adding offsets to a credit card. My question though then is, when you have an elegant, simple concept, how do you prevent you know, a big bank from just saying, we'll start a department you know, internally and, and execute that? I mean, I don't know if it's as simple as That's a confidentiality a waiver. Yeah. And then the corollary question to that on a broader level is, when you have a business with a social and environmental mission like this, in a way, do you almost not want to maintain complete competitive um, monopoly over that idea? In a way, wouldn't you want to see a lot of banks and maybe other startups take up this concept? So how do you, how do you balance that? Those are two great questions, genuinely. Um, the bank told us when, we were, when they approached us that we had three assets that they didn't. One was our environmental credibility, our advisory board. Um, the second was our knowledge base, the kind of thing that Jake just illustrated. Uh, and now we have two staff scientists who are doing this full time, these kind of, addressing these kinds of questions. Um, and the third was that was uh, was around the issue of risk. So that if 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 the idea of connecting uh, credit cards to offsets turned out to be a bad idea, they were at least one step removed. So that's why they found us attractive. Um, uh, your second point, I've never quite thought of it that way, and, and I, I would say exactly. When we were uh, uh, starting to launch, as Jake alluded to, there were some folks in the EU getting a couple of cards going. Wells Fargo had one going. We were all sort of talking to each other. And uh, a, a funny thing happened. We had, through a contact of mine, I had uh, talked with Lorraine Bolsinger, who runs the Eco Imagination, and I, I sort of had chatted her up, and I said, we've got an idea of credit card, da 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 she said, oh, yeah, we've been thinking about that, but our lawyers tell us it's impossible. And I said, well, we've got sort of a simple idea, just, you know, 100 bucks charge, more or less a, a dollar goes to offset. Keep it simple. So I'm sort of laying out the snippet of our business plan, hoping at the time, this was before we had a CEO or anything, that they would say, oh, come on board, and we'll write you a big check. So several months later, we hadn't heard from her, though. They did put, one of her staff actually was sort of put on an account to look into us for a while. So I called her rather spontaneously several months later. I said, hey, Lorraine, how's it going with that credit card? She said, oh, yeah, we've got a really good idea. Sort of keep it simple, $100, you know, dollars worth goes to credit. And she's repeating our business plan. And I first was like outraged. But then I thought, cool. Well, you know, bring it on. So actually, so they did uh, launch a couple of months before we, we did. Um, and we hear from outside folks who are monitoring this that they are not, uh, they're not accelerating the way we are, put it that way. And I think part of it goes back to the fact that they don't have the environmental credibility. So I agree. I think you put it very well. Get this idea out there. Um, yep. Hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted if you could maybe comment on the company Climate Cooler and if you like their methodology, if you would see yourselves doing something along those lines. Maybe you can also explain. If you want me to, I can. Yeah, why don't you Michael, explain who they Michael are, Michael? This is Michael, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, why don't you explain it, and then we'll talk well, about it. Well, yeah. basically, my understanding is what they're doing is looking at the actual purchases that you make and offsetting what the carbon emissions are of those products, not just a percentage like what you guys are doing. Right. So there, we admitted, and I'll let Jake j jump in here too, but we admitted the Michael Galopter part of our story. 
Uh, and so uh, Michael Galapier, for many of you don't know, I think he has a Yale degree, and uh, he was in charge of redefining progress and doing this kind of stuff for a long time. And he was another person in this global conversation about doing this. And so we were quickly put in touch with this guy. We talked, we would chat it up, et cetera, et cetera. I'll never forget there was one trip when we were in Washington meeting with some of our advisory board members. And Jake and Andrew are literally following Michael around as he's getting phone calls from Bill Clinton, you know, and barely had time for us, I must say. But uh, so, uh, and then they, they went and did this idea, Climate Cooler, um, and have recently honestly been back in touch with us. And so we would, it would be a wonderful opportunity to try to do something together. Um, honestly, these are difficult times for startups. Let's face it. I used to say to Jake and Andy when the idea began, the odds of you succeeding, I think the first odds I gave them were 2,000 to 1. Uh, and then once they had a little check, I think I said, well, maybe it's now, you know, 800 to 1. And we boiled it down. I think now our odds are about 1 to 1. I think, I think we have about a 50% chance of, of really making it. Um, but it's tough times. And so I think all of us, including Michael and other groups, are seeing maybe there are allies out there that we could deal with. And so we're, we're open to that idea. Do you want to add anything about yeah, that you know, experience? Yeah, I'd add, actually, M Michael's model is, is, is really interesting because it, it, it looks very similar to a card that was finally launched in the Netherlands, Green Card Visa. Um, and they were able to get SKU level data to, uh, on, on credit card transactions to the, um, to the level of detail of the item purchased. And they could put it into a number of, I think, 10 different categories. If you're buying petrol, uh, you know, there was a certain carbon coefficient that would be multiplied through by the, by the, the purchase um, total. And uh, Michael's doing much the same thing. Our early model um, assumed that uh, Americans, even, even Americans that were getting into carbon offsets, weren't yet interested in really delving into the details of their footprint. Um, so we just kind of cut that level of detail out. But I think as, as we become more aware in the U.S., um, th that type of model is really going to be powerful. And I think there are a lot of commonalities between our story and his. Yep. So I, I actually have two questions for you. Thanks for being here today, by the way. Um, the first one is, how do you as a company deal with the, uh, the perception and transparency issues in this market? You, you alluded earlier that, you know, that, that it, it's kind of a Wild West type of market, yep. right? So how do you deal with that as a company? And secondly, I'm actually interested in your company's uh, sort of profitability model. I, I, it's not yet clear to me how you said you're not your for-profit entity. How do you make money? Um, I'll deal with the first. Do you want me to talk about the first? Sure. And you can talk about the second. Um, so we have a policy, pants. This is our offset policy. So when we're at events, we have a big set of you know, pair of blue jeans. It's very clever. Uh, it's permanence, additionality, new construction, transparency, and social value added. Um, though actually we're in the process of reformulating us. It, the, the two big things in the offset world, as probably most of you know, are transparency and additionality. With actually I think the latter being most important. A project that comes along and says I want to sell carbon offsets, but it's people who are doing the same thing they've always done. A farm that's just farming the way it always has, but notices that actually somebody tells them it. It, it, the way they do it sequesters carbon, that's no good. It, it has to be additional in the sense that the, the change that brings about carbon reductions would not have happened without an infusion of capital that comes from, from a company like ours. Um, transparency is, is right behind additionality as a key thing. And we honestly just spend a lot of time on this. We have, without revealing any secrets, we have been um, in the last several months pushing our own model very hard internally, putting a lot of staff time into making sure what we say is true. Um, and to the degree that we have not been satisfied with that, um, not so much our product, but the process, we are continuing to ramp up. So we're going to have a, a we're, I alluded to it, that we'll have a new policy soon that I think will do even better. In the long run, this Wild West market will converge, starting to, around standards. You probably know there's a gold standard. There's a, several other standards out there. And I think there'll be a weeding out process, as we've seen in the forest market. FSC basically dominates now. SFI, the industry certification uh, uh, um, uh, approach, has, has, has more or less gone by the wayside. So I think in the long run, there'll be a guaranteed good housekeeping seal of approval that will win, because it's the best one. And that process is very much ongoing now. Um, 
but we have two staff scientists. Even as we left this morning, I was getting an update from our CEO about this very issue to making sure we're the very best. Because I think you can only make one mistake. Uh, very quickly, a competitor, TerraPass, um, they, they, got, they had some tough news about a year and a half ago in terms of an offset project that they were trumpeting. Business Week did a big article. They interviewed the farmers, and they said, we don't know what you're talking about. And it, it could have ended that company. And much to their credit, they got right in front of it. They said, we're going to change everything. We're going to have complete openness. Give us your questions. They have a blog now. And so I think that's it. If they make one more mistake, I think that'll, that really could hurt them. So we haven't had one of those yet. And we're hoping we never have one. But I think it's, it's that tight of a market. Um, Jake, you want to address the profitability, and then we'll see if there's any follow-up. Sure. Uh, there's no profitability. <laughs> we're a few years out. Um, that's why we're anticipating that 25,000. <laughs> No. <laughs> We're not. A, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, th there are there are very few revenue channels right now. It's a very simple model, just as the product construct is. Um, you know, spend a dollar on your card, uh, you're getting effectively a service, which is us delivering a certain amount of carbon reduction uh, through the carbon marketplace. Um, a lot of what we do is going out and selecting these specific projects, wind projects, uh, ho hopefully solar coming up, um, all sorts of innovative ways to, to reduce emissions uh, from renewable energy. Uh, and via providing that service, we're allowed to sort of take a cut because you know we're, we're going out and buying it, buying renewable energy wholesale effectively and then bringing it to marketplace. So standard, almost retail model we're taking a cut off of that service. Um, and then again, uh, we have two products out, the credit card and the debit card. And now there's uh, also a way to redeem your world points, um, which is another rewards program for, for offsets. Um, if we bring customers to the table, that's valuable to the bank. There is a nominal finder's fee available. Um, much of what we brought to the table was uh, this reach into this emerging uh, these new non-traditional demographics. Um, LOHAS is one you, you may have studied called Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. Um, millennials is another. Um, the youth climate movement, these are all different marketplaces. Uh, a lot of our business model was based on the idea of going out and reaching into con uh, consumer sets uh, that the traditional bank marketing tactics hadn't been able to reach into before. Thank you guys both for coming. You all almost answered my question, which I was waiting to hear. And I actually uh, was able to meet with some people from Green Order on their GE's Earth Reward cards. And their model, as I understand it, is that they uh, basically fund offsets and they have a certification that comes in and certifies that. And part of the problem that Green Order ran into is they developed and certified, the same company developed and certified the model. Right. And just if you could clarify, because you were Getting it looks like you are, are developing a variety of offsets, and if so, who do you work with to guarantee uh, that? Is it scientists on your board, or is that how is that integrated? So the way the process works is we up up to now we have procured um, offsets from the company up the road from us, Native Energy, which is traditionally rated as one of the best in the country, um, and so that's been a good relationship to date. Um, as we sort of project in the future. Um, and, and think about a broader policy that will involve but not be restricted to them, uh, an evolution of a company that, that shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, we will continue to do what we do now, which is a third party audit. Um, and so to the degree that they were our direct supplier, we have been auditing what we've gotten from them, as one would expect. Um, and I think, as I was alluding to in terms of the other question, I think we'll all be better off when a third party standard evolves. I th it seems to me that the gold standard is the best. So if, if that is the one at play, then we'll embrace that. It, it's actually just too confusing a marketplace right now. One of our potential offset providers, a, a, a big player um, on the East Coast, has told us that approach they're thinking of adopting is to say there are three standards, all of which are third party. Gold, um, I, I have it in my notes, I can't remember, but two others that they see emerging based in the EU. And that essentially they'll say, we can provide offsets in any of these three categories at various price points, knowing that the gold standard, in their opinion, is the most rigorous. So I think that's the kind of direction people will go at. It might be that when you're doing a trip down to Yale and it's students 
they're saying, look, we, we don't have a lot of money to throw around. So the price point we can afford is $8 a ton. You get a certain type of offset. But somebody else might be say, I'd be willing to pay more because I get sequestration out of it. Or investing in solar projects in New Haven. That has a value to me. So I, that's how I view it, a, a, a set of third party certified products at different price points that become sort of the coin of the realm. Thanks for this. I was wondering if you could comment um, on your impressions on one part of the voluntary carbon market that people talk about, and that's come up, and, and the idea that it's very innovative, um, and maybe just any impressions that you have about why that's happening or what kinds of innovations are happening. Any thoughts? Um, well, I, I think I think that's that's the most exciting part to us about the voluntary marketplace um, is it's getting into technologies that. Um, perhaps are not uh, would not fall under these types of certifications that they have in the EU um, that John was alluding to. Uh, I think we're going to see the continuation of the voluntary marketplace even under uh, Obama's um, cap and trade system that he's already already alluded to uh, publicly um, because of that reason um, to go back uh, and look at new ways to avoid carbon emissions through innovation um, and. And so you're, are you looking at what types of innovations that we're going to be seeing through, through this marketplace? You know, from a from a a non um, a non technological um, standpoint, there's there's a lot of innovation in forest offsets right now. Um, we're seeing one of the major uh, criticisms or critiques rather of of buying forest sequestration offsets, which is um, you know that the act of, uh, of uh, a living organization organism pulling uh, CO2 that's already been released into the atmosphere out and fixing it in in in, in biomass. Um, is that there's, it's hard to guarantee the permanence of that project. Um, it's hard to guarantee that, that in 10 years there won't be some sort of natural disaster that lets, lets the CO2 uh, is re-released. Um, some of the innovations in the standards are, uh, are, are basically requiring that these companies that sell this type of offset are building a broad enough portfolio um, and setting the discounts such that uh, across the portfolio the projects will will meet or beat expectations so even if one forest was going up in a fire um, across the board it, it would it would meet or, or beat the uh, co2 reduction uh, estimates I think that's that's a very cool innovation we're going to see coming up in the next couple of years so but, but I'll, I'll quickly jump in on your your broader point which I really appreciate innovative people are trying innovative stuff in this market and I think it relates to some of our points that if you really care about getting ourselves to clean energy in a hurry, the world's biggest challenge ever, one can argue. And you want to do it in the business market, which is a very important place for it to be done. This is a product that generates a lot of excitement. The idea of matching purchases to offsets, when you go down and, and do your class trip, for example, is a really good idea. And it's sort of ripe for innovation. So I would say it's a combination of the product itself that asks for innovation and the kind of innovative people coming from places like this and, and, and Middlebury that are coming to it. So it's a very nice formulation, I think, of what's going on. TerraPath started out of a class, too. You may know it. I think it was a business school class at Penn. So Brian's now going to grill me about that, that B I gave him. No, no, no. I was pretty happy with the B. <laughs> um, I actually had a question that I think you know the JF and a couple others of the people in this room and I have talked about recently, which is, there's a little bit of confusion about the legitimacy of paying for an offset for developing a wind power project because you're essentially selling the future offsets of that project today with no guarantee, one, that the project is definitely going to happen 
and two, that the project is going to happen at the financial calculations that you're making at time zero when looking at the project. So I'm trying, we've been trying to figure out what is the, what's the way, I'm hoping this isn't giving away some secret for you or Native Energy, but what is the way of really guaranteeing that that money that goes into Native Energy for funding wind projects in particular, which are really high, intens you know, high intensity in terms of capital, how do, you, how do you guarantee the offset quantity in the future to somebody giving money now? Well, I mean, I think the long and the short of it is you can't guarantee it. There is no certainty for the precise reason that you mentioned. A hurricane could come along and, and, and blow away a wind turbine. So you need the portfolio approach that Jake is, is mentioning. However, what can you do? If, if you go to our site, you can see the Ray wind turbine, which was a wind turbine put up for the school district of Ray, W-R-A-Y in Colorado. That's a wind turbine that would not have been there without our partner, Native Energy, who came up with the capital that allowed the, the, the school district to bundle with other capital they got from, from the, the state to create clean, green energy, clean energy. Wouldn't have been there without Native Energy and therefore our, our, our customers. Um, so how does the process work? Behind the scenes, and this is the job that I have along with Gus Beth, Billy Parrish, Terry Kellogg, all with Yale pedigrees, as well as Minnie Luber. The five of us are our project selection committee. The job we have is to dig into the documentation provided to us by Native Energy and soon, without a doubt, others, and say, is this legit? What they do with these future stream kind of offset, in terms of selling now offsets in the future, is put in a social discount rate. You just discount stuff in the future, as you all have learned. And they put in another very tough discount rate associated with risk. And they follow the carbon neutral network that started on the West Coast by a, a, an entrepreneur named Sue Hall. So if they think, let's say, that the wind turbine based on the alternative, coal in Colorado, will offset over the course of its 20-year life, I'm just making up an arbitrary number, a million pounds, They'll offset through discounting, bring it down to maybe 900,000, and then risk, again, maybe down to 800. And then they tend to bring it down even more. I mean, so they are very tough on themselves. One of the reasons I was always attracted to Native Energy from the get-go is that they use tough standards that were actually brought to bear by environmentalists. But there is no guarantee. So that's why we have to be so on the alert ourselves, have two staff scientists to keep an eye out. The Ray Wind Turbine, about which I've, I've just been talking, um, embarrassingly stopped turning in early August. And it actually got out on some right-wing blogs who, because Al Gore advocates them, were attack, attacking offsets. When we heard about this, we went into action. We called Native Energy and we said, what's going on? There's a video going around the web. The thing isn't turning. That could kill us. Well, they got on the phone to Ray. Turns out they were missing a part. And the suppliers had said, well, we can't get you the part for six weeks. And we said, that, get the part now. And very quickly, the part had, the thing was up and running. So. That's what, that's the service that Jake mentioned. That's how hopefully we will make a profit someday by providing as close to, guarantee is not the right word, but as close to an assurance as you can that this is the best possible product for doing what you can. Right. Fine. Yep. Is the risk associated with the methane biosensors much, much lower than the risk uh, I think they use, it's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I think they use a different risk coefficient for the two technologies, but I'll verify that. Yeah, good question. I guess I'd just like to build on that a little bit then. If, um, when, when a company like Native Energy is investing in, in these projects, finding these projects, are they looking for projects that essentially would not be funded by you know, a fully functioning capital market because it's not uh, cost effective on its own. Precisely. And are the are the offsets based on the total cost of the project or just the excess necessary funding beyond what the capital markets would provide for that project and that risk level? The latter. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yep. So I, I just sort of have a follow on question to some you know some 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 of the questions everyone here has asked. I'm curious in how you evaluate projects in terms of uh, financial metrics, like to the extent that you know you have the difference between a wind farm and a 
and, and a methane digester, which, which happen to have very different capital uh, requirements. Do you look at sort of, you know, tons of emission, t tons abated versus, uh, you know, I relative to the, to, 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 the, to the capital expenditure required? The argument being that, you, you know, you want, in, a, in an ideal world, you'd want to fund projects that emit the most for the least amount of money. Or do you look at things like, you know, other social metrics like, you know, may maybe, maybe wind farms are sexier projects, right? So. so the answer is both. I'll just quickly jump in and then Jake yeah. fill in. I, it's hard for me not to pick up this chalk and write a marginal abatement cost curve on the board, but I'll refrain myself. But basically that's what we're trying to do, right? Uh, is, is the best possible one at the lowest point on the curve, though, as demand shifts out, prices are going up, no surprise. Um, we don't do that, though in our current relationship with Native, nor I think in our current relationship with other potential providers, they're the ones who are deciding, is it profitable to sell this kind of offset at this price on the wholesale market to us, and eventually through other venues as well. So we monitor that, obviously, but what we're trying to do is get the best possible offsets for our customers, yes, at the lowest possible price, just like any other good or service. I think coming back to the question from the back of the room, eventually I see it in terms of your second good question, us being able to say, and this is down the line, choose your offsets. And if you want one with a really high social value added, Billy Parrish, who, who is a, again, a great product of this campus, he really wants, he's talked to me about Yale actually buying offsets that would be uh, weatherizing and making more efficient low income households in this area, which would be just completely fabulous on any number of metrics. But that might be more expensive. I'd like to see a market where you can buy that kind of offset. Again, choose where you want to be, if you will, on that curve. And to go, uh, to give a quick example, um, some of our projects out in the Midwest are on, uh, we look at the power control grid. Um, and that's the regional grid of, of, of electricity that supplies uh, energy to anybody that's plugging into the wall. Um, and in the Midwest, there's a lot of coal. Uh, so for a megawatt hour of clean renewable energy from, say, a farmer-owned wind turbine, uh, you're getting almost a ton of, of associated CO2 reduction. Now, if you're in uh, California or the Northeast where the grids are much cleaner, uh, it, it can be up to as much as half of uh, associated CO2 reduction. So in the Midwest, that, that's a, especially where the projects are getting very little, um, the cost of uh, the price that a, a project owner can get for, their, for selling to the grid is very low, uh, and, and the benefit to the carbon reduction is very high, that's a target target area. And, and again, uh, looking in New England, uh, where we have renewable portfolio standards in place, Massachusetts utilities are, are required, I think, to purchase 10 or 15 percent of their power um, from renewable sources, um, or they have to pay a tax of, of five cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and that drives price up to just below five cents, because, um, you know, if, 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 they, if they didn't meet that if they didn't meet the 10 percent, they would just, um, if, if the price were more than five cents, they would rather simply pay the tax. Um, so that's, that sort of manhandles the economies of that and brings the price for renew renewables up. So in New England, it's very hard to find quality carbon offset projects because of that reason. Be sorry, because the projects already get substantial funding from the sale of it to the grid. I'm really sorry if, sorry if you partly just answered one of my questions because I was just jotting down my thought. Um, so I had two questions. One was you mentioned a turbine possibly being out of commission for a few weeks. And do you extend the project life of the turbine should that happen and factor that into your calculation? And I was curious what the project life of the turbine is. Do you estimate it conservatively in order to take account of technical failures? And the second question was, do you have a threshold for a minimum ROI, some kind of return that the commercial investors expect, and then when the project can't meet that, you will step in in order to produce that ROI for them that will then enable the project? Is that how you then... That's not, that's not the way we are calculating the service we provide. It is embedded, I think, in the way that our wholesale providers are doing it. So we're not doing those kinds of calculations, but we, we would look to our providers to be doing those, right? Because again, they're offering us offsets at a price point. Um, any good offset policy, 
which is the one that we have and we're making even better, should do exactly what you've said. If a project stops going, we extend the life of the project. So the answer is yes. And the answer is yes to your other question related to wind. Um, uh, it, it, you, had, you asked a question about discounting and underestimating the life of the project, which we also do. That's probably what I had in my head in terms of the third way we discount. Yep. This is a tremendous opportunity for us. And stay in touch with us. We, uh, we have the various cards to pass around. But more generally, visit our website and, and keep asking good questions. And we'd love to hear about your ideas and, and stay in touch. I have another excuse to come down. And we didn't get to go to Pepe's this time, so <laughs> next time. <laughs> We're going to Tali's tonight. <laughs> okay. So let's thank Dr. Isham and uh, Jake Whitcomb. Thank Bye. you, guys.